started, we wanted to wait a few minutes because the road was closed and it's very cold and we thought some other people might show up. Uh, a very cold day, but a room is full of um, scholars and writers and that makes it hot. <laughs> um, James McConkie came to Cornell in 1956 and taught here until 1992. And I may add, I don't think he missed a reading in that time. And uh, he certainly um, continued to attend readings in this room and others. Uh, the most faithful audience, I think, in the history of the program. And thank you for that with this uh, attendance. And I'm here today, too. And he's here today, too. <laughs> uh, before coming to Cornell, still a very young man, uh, James McConkie, we call him Jim. Jim served in the Army during World War II and was severely injured and nearly killed in a Jeep accident at, uh, shortly after the Normandy <coughs> invasion. He's written very eloquently about seeing the light and, and being saved by, I think, penicillin at that time. Eventually, uh, he went to the University of Iowa uh, where he received a PhD and overlapped with a writer named Flannery O'Connor. After serving as a professor in Kentucky, and he's written a whole book about that experience, he took a position at Cornell. Nabokov was still here, and so were two of what became many uh, of Jim's famous writer former students, Thomas Pynchon and Richard Carina. Uh, I might add that two other of his former uh, famous students, well, at least one's a student, was Laurie Moore. Oh, yeah. And uh, Alice Fulton was also here when Jim was teaching. Uh, uh, two big names. I don't know if Alice is here, but uh, I'll call out to you. Um, Jim, after he retired in 1992, he continued to write and publish. During the time he was at Cornell, he was an editor of Epic. He was the chair of the Council for the Arts. He was the arts advisor to the provost, and he helped found the MFA uh, program, which has brought many of you uh, to this room today. He also helped in many different ways, but also chiefly as an advocate, sustain the undergraduate and graduate writing programs when there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm among all of, quite all of the English faculty and uh, when there was very little funding for writers or for readings or for epic. I think I can safely say that we would not be gathered here today as a writing community and reading community if it were not for the work on behalf of the English Department, the Program in Creative Writing, and the University, uh, the work of Jim McConkie. The occasion of this reading is the republication of Jim's book, Court of Memory, and I think it has a new title. Is it now called The Complete yeah, it's, Court it's of now Memory? Done. It's <laughs> all over. <laughs> <laughs> the Completed Court of Memory. Uh, one of 14 books that Jim has written or edited, and surely one of the best books ever written by an American. I first encountered the book in The New Yorker when sections of it were being published, and could not believe my luck when the next year, I got to meet the author and take a position in his university. When I returned to my home at university after my interview, and it was a nearly disastrous interview, but I think because I did so poorly, uh, Jim led the writers in voting for me. I think, you know, I think it was a kind of a, a pity vote, and they said, you know, if we don't hire her. I had the same experience when I was a waitress. If we don't tip her, she won't make any money. And uh, I think they thought, <laughs> thought, if we don't hire her, no one will. And when I got back to my home university, the first question the fiction writers asked me was, did you meet James McConkie? Is he nice? <laughs> because how could anyone be as nice as the James McConkie is in those brilliant stories that are now appearing in the New Yorker? That's a true story, Jim. Is he nice? It's hard not to think of Court of Memory as a book of fiction, although Jim has said that it is not fiction and that his project for many decades has been to write about real life and not make anything up and reflect on life and not make anything up while reflecting. What he writes about is his family life, 
and the animals that share it. And uh, I was once a part of a house sitting team and fed many of those animals. I was, it was amazing how many there were. There were horses, dogs, cats, and there were some birds that seemed to be expecting to be fed as well. I mean, wild birds. It was like going to the home of St. Francis. <laughs> His life has not always been happy. His father, and he's written about this, his father left the family for three years to marry another woman, so there's been some darkness there, some reason to be unhappy. But Jim McConkey always writes his way back to the light. Rarely have I encountered in any writer's writing a heart as large as the heart of Jim McConkey. To read him is to experience the capacity to forgive and the capacity to love. I mean that literally. I feel at times as if I have loved Jim's three sons and I've only met one of them. <laughs> in fact, I just met another one and a son-in-law, but I feel, I feel I've loved you all my life, Larry. <laughs> because you, if you are reading good work, whether you call it fiction or just narrative, you experience the powerful emotion that created that work. And that's one of the reasons it's always a pleasure, and it's also very moving to read something by James McConkie. Today, some of his family is here. That's why I've met more than one son, and I would like to welcome them, uh, Larry and Diana, as well as Chris, uh, and ask you to join me in welcoming Jim back to Cornell and back to the podium. Thank you. You've just heard a statement. Uh, which you can either accept or reject. <laughs> it was very nice. I'm willing to accept it. <laughs> if my plans don't go awry at the last moment, as they often do, uh, I'm going to read a couple of forwards. The first to this book, The Complete Chord of Memory, and the second to Crossroads, the initial volume in the series. Following that, I'll read excerpts from a couple of narratives. Actually, these do stand, if, if, if they work properly, they really have an organic unity and can stand the stories. So I'll read a couple excerpts from a couple of narratives that make up the final volume, A Song of One's Own. <clears throat> Roughly the four volumes constitute stages of my life of our life when Jean was still with me, and I couldn't have written any of them if I hadn't believed that my life was representative of that of others, because it's a fairly ordinary life. Most of us have lives like that. <clears throat> the, that final volume is about our last years together as elderly husband and wife. <clears throat> In writing the foreword, to the complete chord of memory, I wanted to be as accurate as I could be about the details of Jean's burial service and consulted the photographs taken by one of my nieces. I wrote it in the plainest language I am capable of and was true to what I felt and said, as true as anybody can be to something he's just experienced. And here's the forward to this and the reason for this book. Gladys Jean, my Jean, died at our home, the Greek Revival farmhouse at the crossroads we bought more than 50 years ago. She died of leukemia at the age of 89, and on March 3rd was buried at Green Springs Natural Cemetery Preserve, about 15 miles from our house. Green Springs is unusually high ground and provides lovely vistas of hills, forests, and valleys. It is often windy there, 
and in winter covered with snow. In other seasons, as grass rises and then ripens in the meadows, Green Springs becomes a habitat for birds. Statuary, mausoleums, headstones, constructions of any kind are prohibited. Natural burials are as simple as possible and are intended to avoid environmental harm. Jean's body, wrapped in a shroud, was carried on a plank through snow on a path of pine boughs to the gravesite. A blue canopy covered the open grave and the space for spectators to stand. A cushioned folding chair was reserved for me, Jean's 91-year-old survivor. The service, at my request, was limited to family members. They were our three sons, both of our daughters-in-law, Jean's nephew, Dale, who lives with us, one of her nieces with her husband, and a grandniece. From long custom, I use we and our as if Jean were still alive. It's a habit I don't mind holding on to. <clears throat> Two thick boards have been placed over the narrow part of the grave. The four pallbearers, Dale and our three sons, Larry, Chris, and my namesake, Jim, lowered the plank containing the shrouded body to, the, to those boards, where it remained during the brief service led by the coordinator of spiritual care for hospice care. After several minutes for silent meditation, she asked us to share with each other our reflections, to say whatever was on our minds. We were bundled up against the cold. We were surrounded by snow. We were gathered around a body that, encased in its white shroud, was shaped like a carrot. A description like that sounds bleak, but that is almost the reverse of the setting's effect upon me. First of all, that shrouded figure was not Jean. Her consciousness, her mind, her memory had vanished, fled. Her body would soon be returning to the natural world from which it had come, and that would be true of mine and the bodies of us all. I felt an intimacy with the others at that gravesite that went beyond family. And of course, it came from the knowledge that all of us, all living creatures, creatures are mortal. I listened while other family members spoke about their memories of Jean, though I decided not to say anything because I didn't want to break down the way survivors often do at funerals. I was surprised to find myself speaking of something that had never occurred to me over the decades that I'd been writing the autobiographical narratives that constitute court of memory. Hadn't realized, really, until I heard my own voice now acknowledging this new awareness. Jean is so crucial to this major work of my writing career, but I couldn't have written it without her presence. The present volume, The Complete Court of Memory, is dedicated to her. It reprints the three previously published parts, Crossroads, The Stranger at the Crossroads, and Stories from My Life with the Other Animals, and provides a conclusion to the series, A Song of One's Own, the final part, consists of personal narratives not previously collected. And then I'm reading next uh, another forward to uh, Crossroads. It's the, uh, I'm reading it because it's applicable, it's a uh, forward to the first volume, uh, but it's applicable to everything in the completed work and indicates the reason for my attention to all the ordinary details of our lives and surroundings. And it gives you a, a, maybe a greater sense of the content of the book, of, of the complete book. <clears throat> One night more than 20 years ago, let's say 50 years ago now, <laughs> as I sat in the basement study of my former home in Ithaca, New York, I underwent a change so radical that it transformed my apprehension both of the world and of valid reasons, valid modes for writing about people. <clears throat> It was one of the earlier winters of our continuing Cold War with the Soviet Union. I can't remember the pre precise event that led to my change, for it merges in my mind with so many similar ones in the late Eisenhower, early Kennedy years, 
that the resumption of nuclear testing by the Soviet Union and then by the United States, the fear that led to the construction of family fallout shelters throughout America, and I know a number of them right here in Ithaca, and the crisis first over Berlin and then over Cuba all seem to have occurred during the daylight hours preceding that January night. The house was on a slope so that the study was ground level with windows facing the backyard. My children's German shepherd, now long dead, lay sleeping on a couch near my desk. It was late. When I was younger, I chiefly wrote in the hours surrounding midnight, and my wife and children also slept two stories above. I had just finished writing a story, a fairly conventional third-person narrative in which a child assumes the cold and impervious nature of his mother in order to, order to defeat an emotional and wholly vulnerable, vulnerable father. I was dissatisfied with it, though I thought it well written. What did that story have to do with my present feelings? What did it have to say ab about a society that might destroy itself with nuclear missiles very soon? Always I had assumed my love for my wife and children, but not until that night did I know its extent. Everything about me had become transformed. My desk, the books on the shelf, my reflection in the dark glass. Momentarily, I turned off my lamp so that I could see what lay beyond my window. Snow covered the ground and was shimmering in the light of the stars. I could even see the whiteness of a little mound of it in an empty bird's nest in the bare branches of the maple. The nest possessed for me a sudden, quite extraordinary value, and so did the cold, moist nose of the dog. The meaning inherent in that nose was so intense that I will remember it all my life, that I will remember all my life, the simple experience of touching it. The story I had written was unsatisfactory because it was made up. It had, this was discussed earlier very nicely. <laughs> a, a fiction, one devoid of the sacredness I saw everywhere about me. The only way open to me to, to communicate the strength of my feelings was through myself, through my intimate experiences, through memory and personal observation. I did feel kinship with a character from fiction, though, Conrad Deku in Nostromo, a great novel. As he, awaiting the destruction of a city and political state, writes a long letter about his activities to his sister in France. In the most skeptical heart, Conrad says, there lurks at such moments when the chances of existence are involved, a desire to leave a correct impression of the feelings, like a light by which the action may be seen when personality is gone. At that moment in my own life, I began an autobiographical account of the meaning implicit in one of the humblest objects imaginable. A botched up nightstand I'd built as a child for my mother had come into my mind and I believed I could use it more readily than the bird's nest or the dog's nose to communicate the value of the ordinary and commonplace. In rereading that account, I realized that I was, as I still am, held by the old truths of literature. My words turned into a statement of the momentary victory of the imagination, not only over mortality, but over those aspects of the real world I had wanted to celebrate. Whatever my wish, I had not escaped fiction. I had simply made myself the central character of a story, finding in my own experiences and dreams a greater authenticity than I could in those of any character I might invent. Though I didn't know it then, that story was the beginning of a book, the first volume of which was called Crossroads, and which is here reprinted with a second, A Stranger at the Crossroads. The change I felt in myself that night was reflected in other writers at roughly the same time. It was a change wrought by a sense of desperation at the folly of public affairs, by a sense of the human irrationality demonstrated in present history and the history of the recent past, including the evils of Auschwitz. When either went inward, 
striving to testify to the meaning that still existed for the individual, treating, trusting that the aspirations and emotional needs of the self so depicted would be representative of the responses of the separate individuals who read about them, or when went outward beyond the personal truth to the region in which the sacred apparently no longer existed, the outer world in which the individual had lost his uniqueness, the world which lacked apparent logic or causality or even substance. I was really thinking then of, of what became postmodern literature in which th this does apply. I, I don't think it applies so fully anymore. More than two decades have passed since that January night, and the sphere which is literature has begun to tremble with whatever possibility that continuance allows, like a bead of water in a blighted but still living rose. If the sense of imminent catastrophe was a provocation of crossroads, an encounter at the crossroads with a young stranger was a seed of the companion volume, begun after a lapse of 10 years. In telling, of his most intimate, telling me of his most intimate concerns, he needed a listener, maybe for a survival, and I was the first he found. He so moved me that I saw myself as someone much like him. I became, in a sense, a stranger at my own crossroads, a man well into his middle years, desiring, now that his children were grown, to understand himself all over again to rediscover a personal order and to communicate what he found to anybody who would listen. Perhaps wishes of this sort are the inevitable result of that displacement of self which a sudden insight into human mutuality provides. I have discovered my plot in the relation that exists between my present and past, but the present is always changing. In fact, it doesn't exist and the search for order and understanding must be made again and again in a manner that alters with an altering but yet constant self. What follows is a story of a person who through much of his adult life has been attempting to use memory as a faculty capable of illuminating experience with the truth that matters most to him. Time itself imposes a progression, but progression as we normally perceive it, a continual interweaving of current happening and related remembrance with certain memories, those light motifs of our lives, the events that early shaped us, recurring more frequently than others. <clears throat> Hence, while the chronological headings refer to the years of composition, individual chapters move between a present moment and a moment or a number of them in an ever enlarging past. We are what we were. That was written in 1982. Now I'm going to read now just two excerpts from material in the last volume. Uh, there are two accounts from from the, the, the final volume of of the book, and they're both uh, excerpts, one very brief. The first one is from Happy Trails to All. I wrote it primarily for myself. I wasn't concerned about publication. In fact, I didn't even think, I mean, at that time, I really, there was a question that occurred to me that I wanted to answer for myself, and I sat down to write it. And I didn't really think it would be published, but I sent it to, uh, Ann Fadiman, the American scholar. She not only accepted it, but with her board of advisors, chose it as the best entry, best piece of the whole year, which was very good for my ego. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Uh, You know that phrase, why I write? Someone has said, the answer is obvious in the vowels of each word.
With one exception, all the material in A Song of One's Own first appeared in The American Scholar. For Robert Wilson, who replaced Dan Fadiman as editor, kept encouraging me to keep writing. I kept telling him this is the last thing, and he said, no, it isn't. <laughs> Happy Trails is an attempt to sum up my life as best I could at the time. I guess there's a certain amount of irony in the very brief segment I've chosen. I may be in my 80th year, I'm in my 93rd year right now, but I'm still trying to explore and understand my own psyche. That's also still true. <laughs> it almost scares me to say it, but I consider my life so lucky that I feel blessed. I always enjoyed the work that supported my growing family. The first paycheck I received gave me a kind of puritanical guilt as payment for fun. <laughs> I love and respect my sons, their characters, as well as their achievements over the odds including the genetic ones they inherited from me, that face us all. I think that the attachment between Jean and me has deepened over, at this time, 56 years of our life together into the kind of bond that marriage partners can only promise each other at the altar. Despite the concluding words of the chorus in Sophocles, Oedipus, Oedipus the King, less accurate than some, though it may be, the translation that always comes first to my mind is called no man happy until he carries his happiness down to the grave in peace. I told myself a number of years ago that Jean and I had won. So recently that I had already commenced this account, I came into the kitchen for a fresh cup of coffee and found her in tears. When I asked her the reason, she said she'd just been listening, the little kitchen radio tuned to a national public radio station was still on playing at low volume a familiar tune, familiar melody, to Garrison Keillor's The Writer's Almanac. He had recited as his poem for the day that well-known sonnet by Shakespeare, linking love to the ever-growing awareness of mortality, to the knowledge that life, like a fire, ultimately consumes itself. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, the concluding couplet has a lover tell his beloved to love that well, which thou must leave ere long. Later that day, she said to me, but we have one, haven't we? It was more a brave affirmation than a question. Maybe only those who are embittered, who feel cheated by life, fear death. Neither Jean nor I fear the extinguishing of our own lives, but will the one who survives the nullification of the other's consciousness be strengthened enough by the past to feel himself or herself still a victor. By winning, you obviously lose an enormous amount, but only a fool can complain. And I'm trying not to be a fool as best I can. <laughs> and finally, at the opening to a piece called Fear of Falling, It's quite different in tone and spirit. And it, is, it describes my days as a student janitor on a working scholarship at Cleveland College, mainly an adult education center on Public Square in downtown Cleveland during the last years of the Great Depression. It includes the episode in which Jean and I first met. Like most college graduates, I'm fond of my alma mater, though it exists only in historical records and the memories of those who attended it. In 1939, when I entered Cleveland College on a working scholarship, it seemed solid enough to last for centuries. A seven-story stone building on Public Square, the center of downtown Cleveland, with stout Roman goddesses supporting the balconies on its facade and its hallways, elevators, and classrooms were crowded with students, enrolled less for a degree than for courses to abet their knowledge of culture or to provide skills necessary for employment or a better job. Each year, 20 students from the Cleveland area were granted scholarships like mine, 
and we made up the majority of the full-time students. The Depression had not yet lifted, and without those scholarships, few, if any of us, could have attended college. In our first year, we had no work assignments, but as sophomores and upper-class students, some of us were elevator operators during the evening rush hours, while others sold textbooks or supported the staff in the mailroom, the publicity office, or the telephone switchboard. Although other students were later to join me, I was the first to serve as a janitorial assistant, and it seemed likely that the initial task that Joe Wilkes, the head custodian, gave me was simply an attempt to find something to occupy my allotted work hours. As instructed, I reported to him at 7 a.m. on a Monday morning. He led me to the basement locker room for women students. Connected to the sinks and toilet stalls of the adjoining restroom by an archway, a big archway, without doors. My task was to dusk off the tops of the 10 to 12 rows of lockers before the first woman arrived. It embarrassed me to be assigned such a task, <laughs> not because of its humble nature, but I was a male in a place where I didn't belong. To complete the chore as quickly as I could, I used Joe's tall stepladder to climb to the top of each row. Moving on my knees, I sent a cloud of sooty dust and filaments of spider webs into the air and into my lungs. <laughs> Despite my haste, the first young woman arrived before I was finished. Dismayed by her presence, I imagined she would be alarmed to find a man crouched on a locker above her head, <laughs> a filthy rag in his hand. And so I called out to her as cheerfully as I could, don't mind me. I'm just working my way through college. <laughs> Those words <coughs> were the first ones I spoke to the slender and dark-haired girl I came to love. England and France had just declared war on Germany, but I, like most other Americans, felt our country safe from foreign strife. Throughout the years of my public schooling, I've been taught again and again the folly of warfare, with World War I as a prime example. A few weeks before my graduation, from college, from graduation though, I was an infantry private in the Army, my degree awarded in absentia. Jean, that slender, dark-haired girl, and I, drawn together over the years as members of the, members of the college newspapers, editorial staff, were married on the furlough I was granted just before my division embarked for Europe. The convoy arrived in Cherbourg a few days after the Normandy beach had been secured. Serving as an obedient neophyte on a janitorial staff is not a bad preparation for service as an army private. <laughs> for example, my experience helped me pass inspection whenever a platoon lieutenant put on white gloves to test for dust on the frame of my bed or in the corners of the high window behind it. Impressed by my speed in dusting locker tops, Joe Wilkes promoted me to the crew of custodians that on Saturday mornings washed and polished the tiles of the first floor lobby and wide corridors. And that experience proved pertinent in the Army too. Accompanied by the music of a radio playing at full volume, the rhythmic movements of the Saturday morning floor cleaning squad had something in common with my infantry division's parade drills during which row after row of soldiers stepped to the beat of Susa marches, and for that matter with Tolstoy's depiction in Anna Karenina of the growing pleasure that Levin, surely the author's alter ego here, feels in joining in the line of peasants scything a field. Two or three full-time custodians and I first mopped the floor with a solution, a solution of water and, and sodium, trisodium phosphate. I think that's been outlawed. <laughs> and then, while the tiles were still wet, we moved in unison down the halls, rubbing the abrasive pads attached to our shoe soles against gum and other substances still marring the surface. Ultimately, after rinsing the floors with clean water, we waxed and buffed them. Before we left for the day, we admired our joint accomplishments, transitory though such shining floors were. I felt so joined to my fellow janitors 
that the following year I founded an organization of student full-time custodians, Eta Hatem Eta Mu Sigma, the Greek letters representing the Elevator and Maintenance Society. <laughs> I, I had joined a social fraternity, but when Jean said that yes, she'd like to have my fraternity pin, I gave her the one I valued far more, the society's pin with the image of a mop and a bucket embossed in silver-colored metal. <laughs> she lost it. <laughs> I don't know if Joe himself was unwilling to do it, or if the other full-time custodians had refused, but he chose me, so much younger, and had slimmer and more limber than the others, as the most capable janitor for a special task. The thousands of pigeons that lived on Public Square roosted at night on the surrounding buildings. Many of them roosted on the fifth floor ledge of Cleveland College. The art studio was on that floor, and the art teachers and their students were bothered by the stench of pigeon droppings on the ledge whenever the windows were opened because of heat or paint fumes. My assignment was to climb out, on one, of the, climb out one of the windows to scrape the accumulated layers of guano off about 40 feet of ledge. Joe and I arrived at the studio door to discover that an unscheduled class was in session. Fortunately, the, the door was at the rear and the studio was a large room. Since the students at their easels were gathered in a semicircle, semicircle in front, Joe decided our work wouldn't disturb them. And so we entered, bearing our equipment, a scraper, a brush, a pan, and a metal pail. Joe leading me by the heavy rope he had tied to my waist as a safety precaution. <laughs> From the doorway, we hadn't seen the young woman the students were sketching. Standing on a platform, one arm on the back of a chair, she was the first nude female I'd ever seen. <laughs> were her breasts and the rest of her immaculate body really gleaming in the blue spotlights I continue to carry in my memory? Or is that blue glow my subjective response to what I saw? Though I resolutely turned to the task at hand, I, I was seeing that glow as I stepped out the window onto the ledge. Joe handed me the scraper, brush, and pan once I kneeled outside. With that vision blinding me to all else, I felt no fear, though I doubt that Joe, playing out the rope as I advanced, would have been able to support my weight if I'd fallen. Each time I filled the pan, I returned it to Joe at the open window to dump the dirt into the bucket. So I could have looked at the model again and again, but I didn't. To see her once was a gift granted me by chance. I was no fear of peeping Tom. <laughs> by the time Joe and I had finished, the modeling session was over. The generations of undergraduates I taught at Cornell in the second half of the last century would have been amused, I think, imagine to hear that at their age, their professor's first view of a naked woman enabled him to clean pigeon droppings from a high <laughs> ledge of a college building with the, without the slightest fear of plunging to his death. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Can I sit down for questions? I think it would be helpful. Now that I'm sitting down, you better have some. <laughs> Why do you write? <laughs> Eagle. <laughs> Actually, you know, I write to become subsumed in something larger than myself. But the only way I can get there is through my own self. Oh, thank you. Now you can hear me. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> Did you hear the answer to that? I may not say the same thing. <laughs> you know, why do I write? I, I said first ego, but it's more than that. It's partly that I have to use my ego to get subsumed into something larger than myself, which is really why I write. But I can't do it any other way than through myself.
Yes? And so the teaching uh, uh, amplify your right, or did teaching just take time away from it? And, and did you see any shifts in the no. student writing that you were getting? I, like all teachers, I've sometimes complained about the number of manuscripts I was reading. But no, I, I really feel that I taught generation after generation of Cornell students, and they were all seemed idealistic, and they all were the kind of people I was very glad to teach, the kind of people who would make, if not good writers, good readers, which we have need of. <laughs> Uh, it, uh, it was a pleasure, and it, it really helped. It, uh, it enabled me to maintain a sense of optimism about us, in spite of all the terrible things as a group we do. Yes? Jim, do you have any thoughts about the, the blogosphere and tweeting and other things that uh, are self-revelatory but self-examining perhaps, but also uh, digital and detached? I just don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try not to get involved with it because it, 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 being virtually connected somehow is not the same thing as truly being connected. And I, and I, you know, A.M. Forster's motto in Howard's End was only connect. And that's a pretty good motto. But I don't think you connect through most of the things that are available to us on the internet. You see, I'm very old fashioned. <laughs> yes? I haven't had a chance yet to see the cover of your book, but I know uh, the earlier books were categorized sometimes as autobiographical fiction, and I was wondering whether this one has a slot that's been put on the cover, or how you yourself, um, what term you would give to your writing. We're, we're kind of in the post-memoir times now, you know, yeah, I, and, and your work preceded all that. What is it called here? It, it's very difficult to find the, the right word. Well, actually when I started, started doing this, no one knew what to call it. And it, it's, it's not the same thing, it's certainly not the same thing you normally can, can, think of when you call something a, mem a memoir. I, I, my, I'm not trying to compare myself in any way to him, but a, a great influence on my writing was a, from a really master writer named St. Augustine, who was, in a way, you know, I, I took over from Nabokov the European novel course, and I taught it in a totally different way than he would ever have dreamed of teaching it, because I started the course with the Confessions of St. Augustine. It's, it's not a novel. It's not by a European. <laughs> and it's not something else. <laughs> it's a, and yet, it, you know, uh, the Confessions are one of the bases of our Western literature. That there, there, many people have not read it, but if you do read it at some point, you'll be surprised at how pertinent it still remains in some way. I get so angry at him sometimes. I call him, when I'm angry, I call him St. Augustine and, and to throw the book away. <laughs> but, but as St. Augustine, he's, a, he's really a, a person who, loves friendship, loves connection, loves life. Yes? After you moved away from writing your own fiction, how did it change how you taught fiction? 
how I how I t talked, how I wrote. Did it change how you taught fiction? Uh, oh, uh, yes, oh, of course it did. <laughs> it, it changed everything I did. <laughs> I can't precisely tell you why, but I, I became less interested in in fiction that was just plot driven, that didn't have something beyond the plot. And I wanted my students to be concerned with something beyond themselves. And I, some of them were that way. But it, it's sort of interesting that you have to use the eye to get the first person to get beyond it. I don't, I don't know any other way. To understand the human psyche, you have to understand your own psyche, which is totally impossible. <laughs> you, you just do the best you can. Yes? What gave you the most encouragement? Was it just doing the writing alone, someone in your life who supported you, or, you know, how do you, how do you get going? You know, my parents were, had no books in the house. They, they, they didn't come from them. But when I was in the uh, fifth grade in Paducah, Kentucky, my father moved every year. I was, before I graduated from high school, I went to 15 different schools, which uh, was an education in itself. But I, it threw me back on myself because I n never had time to make friends. It turned out to be not a bad basis for writing. But in Paducah, Kentucky, a teacher asked, me, asked us to write about Christopher Columbus's voyage to America. I was very naive then, but I did write about it. I didn't know about the, what happened to the indigenous people. I, I certainly didn't know that he would right back to Queen Isabella, that he'd come across these natives, these Taino Indians. He said, they're very gentle, they're very generous, they'd make great slaves. <laughs> that was Columbus. <laughs> but uh, I, I, anyway, whatever I wrote about Columbus, the, my, in my naivete, the teacher liked very much, and she just encouraged me to go continue writing. Another, see, I, I don't remember her name. That's, that's bad of me, but I don't. Uh, when I was in the uh, sixth or seventh grade in Little Rock, Arkansas, the teacher took a group of us. She must have self-selected us somehow, and we were in a little seminar room. And she uh, had us respond to a, a poem by Sidney Lanier called The Song of the Chattahoochee. I don't know if you know the Song of the Chattahoochee. High o'er the hills of Habersham, down the valleys of Hall, I hurry amain to reach the plain, run the rapid and leap the fall. That's nice, isn't it? <laughs> run the rapid and leap the fall. Anyway, I, I hadn't known this dimension of words, that the way they sounded could be used in some way to augment meaning. And I was so excited by that that it encouraged my own desire to write. So those are two episodes that did what you asked. And I think, I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> as true as anything I can say. <laughs> yes, Lamar? Question your honesty for a minute, Jim, but if you had decided to make up... If I had what? If you had, if you had decided to make up the first line a young man says to the woman who's going to be his wife, don't bother, don't worry about me, I'm just working my way through college, you couldn't have made up a better one. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say I made it up then. <laughs> but if you want to find a marvelous wife, just be a janitor for a while. Uh, I want to say thank you. Thank you.
think I forgot to tell you that the Zelaznik family is sponsoring this, uh, this reading and all the readings this semester. The visiting writer, Cynthia Ho, will be reading two weeks from today on February 6th. I think that's two weeks. Uh, same time, same place. And uh, three of Jim's books are for sale. The, book, uh, the Buffalo Books has, is uh, selling them here. And also there's a reception upstairs in the English Lounge. Everyone is, of course, invited. And thanks, thanks for coming. And thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. All of you for listening.
anyway, so he loves it. Yeah, I think it's really pretty. Really <laughs> so you're going to be here for a couple of minutes? Just a couple. Yeah. Let me go back. It's Thursday. So <laughs> good. We're having all this cold time. Yeah, it is hard to snow. Like, snow, oh, you have about eight inches. Oh, right. More than eight Oh, yeah. yeah. And but beautiful. Like, yeah. Very, very cold. Yeah. I think we're going to go to the snow. Yeah, it was beautiful. Do you have horses? Yeah. We have eight horses. Yeah, they have three. Diana had. Diana had. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.